Hello, I'm Nancy Pearl. Welcome to Booklist. My guest today at University Bookstore is author China Mieville. China, thanks so much for coming by today. Thanks for having me. You have a degree in international relations from the London School of Economics, and you also spend um, what I imagine is a not insignificant amount of time writing fiction. Mm -hmm. Do you think of one as an avocation and one as a vocation? No, I mean, I, I, was, I was always interested in, in research and I wanted, I was going to be an academic. Um, so, you know, hence went through that, that route and did my master's, my PhD and so on. What I always wanted to do professionally was write, um, but it felt like a bit of a kind of hostage to, write fiction, I mean, but it felt like a hostage to fortune to admit that to the universe. Um, so, you know, and, and I do genuinely enjoy research and so on. So that I was perfectly happy doing that and then when the fiction started to take off I, um, I kind of kept up with the, with the research as well and, and I try and publish the odd thing in academic journals and so on but, but as long as I can make my living writing fiction that's definitely what I would rather do. Do you see your fiction as a reflection of your interest in international relations? My, my head, like most people's head, is a kind of um, washing machine full of kind of jostling nonsense, you know, um, and I think that that both my kind of academic and political interests on the one hand uh, and my fiction interests on the other kind of reach in and grab out from that sort of shared arena. So some of the concerns and the interests I have about the world and I think about the world in sort of political terms and um, kind of interest in questions of sociology and stuff like that are definitely shared, but it's not really one being a function of the other. It's just sort of different different ways of being interested in the same stuff, I think. Right, like different ways of looking at issues of borders and yeah. political systems and... Yeah, and language and, and right. class and and race and, and, and anything. And, and um, um, there's also there's a kind of great joy to kind of playing with those ideas in fiction, but also having you know, kind of spaceships and, you know, monsters and, you know, having your cake and eat it too, you know. Um. <laughs> right, if only you could, like, solve all the problems of the world by having, I say, a, a vice, but it's, you say... A vice, a yeah, in, in the book, in, in, yes, in, yes. in your newest book, Embassy Town. I do sometimes, because I have this kind of um, political um, life milieu, people very often ask me about, you know the extent to which the fiction is they sort of say you know to what extent is your you know are you sending a message with your fiction and I always I always really kind of blench at the idea and I, I sort of feel quite keen to say look you know if if my aim was to in the fiction was to convince people of my political ideas it would be a spectacularly inefficient mode of propaganda right. you know that is not my aim like if I want to make a you know and people will sort of read the books and say oh you know this was I, I could tell you were really talking about the Iraq war or whatever and I'll be like dude if I want to talk about the Iraq war I'll write an article about the Iraq war you know that's not to say that those things are not in the books but I don't like the idea of them being reducible like fiction has to be itself it has to be fiction right even if it also is interested in those kind of ideas. All of your books are so centered in place. I mean, it's sort of, did they begin there for you? Like Perdido Street Station and that sort of world yeah. that, that you've built or, or the, the city in the city or Embassy Town. Do you start with place? Sometimes, like with the, with the, with the Bass Lag books, the Perdido and the Scar and Iron Council, for probably a decade before I wrote Perdita Street Station, I had been kind of building this world and this city, um, quite consciously kind of using it as a kind of rag bag and anything I was interested in, I would just throw in. Um, and I always thought of it as a very kind of teeming, discombobulated, cheerfully undisciplined setting. So that place came first, yes. Um, but then some of the other books like City in the City, it was it was not driven by the, spe the specificity of the place. It was driven by some of the notions of, of, of borders and, and, and the idea of a, of a kind of cross-border crime novel. And then the, the specifics of the settings kind of emerged out of that. Um, and, then, and then in Embassy Town, for example, it was the peg was really more the, the aliens, this notion of a dual-voiced alien that can't lie. That was the peg, and then the mm -hmm. setting kind of built up from that. So I, I, I can't really generalize. When you were thinking about the Perdido 
trilogy, if you mm -hmm. will, um, and you tossed them all into this rag bag. Was that, I, I mean, I know it wasn't a physical bag where you tossed ideas. Was it just in your head that you kept all those? Oh, in? God, no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, because I, I yeah. already admire you, but that would be, like, amazing if you could do oh. that. Well, then I say yes, yes, yes. It, was, it was in my head uh, all the time. No, um, notebooks. I'm, an, I'm, you know, I'm a notebook person. And uh, although I have to say, increasingly, I've, in the last few years, I've been using like physical notebooks much less, and just, um, just, just storing stuff kind of as little scrap notes online and so mm -hmm. on. Um, but basically, I've learned the moment I have an idea about anything, like, you know, what I'm going to have for lunch, let alone. <laughs> the inhabitants of an imaginary world you know mm -hmm. like write it down immediately you know um and and for many years i was like oh that's a really that's a great idea I'm, i'll write that down in an hour or so and the 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 angel or devil on my shoulder is getting louder and louder and being like no you will write it down now because in an hour you will forget and you will remember that you had something to remember but that is all you will remember so <laughs> so perdido street station and that world was kind of accreted out of this mass of notes and slowly kind of organized from there. And in the newest book, Embassy Town, it's so concerned with language. Mm. The main character, Avis, she's a simile, a living simile in someone else's language, a language that she doesn't really get. Yeah. Um, so that's fascinating. At various points I've read bits and pieces of language philosophy with great interest and what happened was a kind of dovetailing of this this notion of these aliens that I mentioned before that I'd been kind of thinking about and trying to do something with and the idea of a very remote human settlement and that kind of dovetailed with some interest in um, various bits and pieces of language philosophy that I'd been reading and getting very interested in the nature of language and the nature of signification and symbology and 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 so on I'd been reading like I A Richards and um, Tran Duc Tao and, and various people like that and um, for me sometimes quite abstruse theoretical ideas can actually be a kind of spur to fiction. And it, obviously you can't make it sort of tediously professorial, you know, I mean right. it can't be about, if, if you have, a, if you have a, a thesis you want to expound then a novel is not the place for it. Um, but, but I do sometimes find that those ideas kind of push, push my, um, my fiction on so so for me it can be quite inspiring and I and I was finding reading this stuff quite quite interesting and the ideas that it was throwing up was um, were were fascinating to me and you don't have to come to any conclusions in fiction you can throw around the ideas but not sort of you know say well in conclusion I think this right. so it was very liberating to, to sort of uh, kind of coalesce those two things so are you a Chomskyan <laughs> in terms of language in terms of politically language. you know you, are. Um, you know he's, he's right. I've, I've got a lot of respect for for Chomsky politically um, Gary Wolf said this in a review recently so it was a really good point is that a, a discredited theory can still be a really interesting peg for fiction you don't have mm -hmm. to be putting forward an argument now I wouldn't think of Embassy Town as a Chomsky novel no. I would think of it as a uh, as I say, a, a Richardsian novel, or, or a, a Tauian novel, or, or a, a Derry Dying novel. Or Maybe you know these things, but but I can say these things with a kind of um, sort of rather vague swagger because I don't have to pin myself down to them. This is this is the luxury I have. And so that's the difference between writing those academic papers yeah. and writing this is that you get to let yourself go in many different directions. Yeah, plus more spaceships in the fiction. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's very <laughs> oh, difficult yeah, to but you could put some spaceships cram those in, in to, the, to, the, to the stuff on international law, you know. Uh, if you were a simile? I like that idea in the, in the book of somebody becoming embedded in language, but what I'm going to say is I think the whole point for me with the, with the book is that you're not in control of the way language wrestles with you and, and grasps you. You're part of it, you're part of that process, but it's not reducible to your intent. So if I were to take seriously the notion of being a simile, then it wouldn't be up to me what I was a simile. Right. I might like to think I am like all kinds of awesome things, but uh -huh. um, somebody else might think I'm like a total waste of space, whatever, you know, I mean, it doesn't. It's not my choice. So let's talk about Unlondone, your first teen novel or novel for young people. Where did that idea come from? I kind of wanted to write a homage to the books that I read when I was a kid that kind of filled me with this kind of intense, joyful sense of sort of inhabiting a book. The way a younger reader inhabits a book, it always feels to me different from the way I read books now. 
trying to kind of tap into that same feeling that I got from reading Joan Aiken and Lewis Carroll and Michael Larabati and um, you know people like that that sort of that that kind of um, fantastic in both senses children's literature um, so I wanted to write a kind of um, urban Alice um, that was that was a that was a kind of a, a great sort of loving homage to all that and that also played S rudely with some of the sort of tropes of destiny and so on, which was something that had always irritated me, even as a young reader. I, I always got very, I, I took great umbrage at chosen ones in fiction, because I was never quite sure I was chosen, you know, so it felt a bit exclusive to me. So yes, I wanted to kind of right. riff on that. Get your own back. This one was one for the sidekicks. Yeah, right. Those of us who were the sidekicks of history, you know, um, <laughs> thought we'd get our moment. Well, there's a good simile for you. China Mieville, a sidekick of history. Or, you know, China Mieville is like a sidekick of history. I'll, I'll take or that. Or whatever. Yeah. Who else did you read as a child, and who do you read now with admiration as a, an adult? Fantasy, science fiction, and supernatural horror have always been my literary homes. That's always been my, um, my, my, my kind of, uh, my ranch, you know. Um, when, when you're asked who your kind of, um, who your admired authors are, I always feel very predictable. Like I always feel like, is anyone who reads anything I write going to be surprised to discover that Ursula Le Guin and Lovecraft and Philip K. Dick, you know, and Robert Silverberg and Pamela Zolene and Octavia Butler and you know, is that, is that going to surprise anyone? It's not going to surprise anyone, you know. So to me, what I'm always more interested in is you have a sense, rightly or wrongly, of those people who are maybe less intuitive. So I always want to say. All the people you can immediately intuit, plus Charlotte Bronte, um, uh, um, Dan Budzo Marichera, the Zimbabwean writer, um, people like that, uh, and, and then recent people who are coming up, um, who I've sort of, coming up in my life, they may have been writing 10 years, I've been getting very interested in, I, I'm, I'm really, really fascinated by Michael Sisko's work at the moment, I think is amazing. Uh, Helen Oyeyemi, I think, is wonderful. And then people who you rediscover from, from history, who've, who are these kind of writers that maybe haven't had the clout they've deserved. So I've, I've just been getting into Barbara Commons and been blown away oh, by her. Oh, our spoons Absolutely came from Woolworths. Stuff. Wasn't that one of hers? Yeah, yes. and The Vet's Daughter, yes. which just blew my mind. Yeah. So, and I love discovering people. And I, I, I don't mind that sense of ignorance when it's ignorance that is, in myself, I mean, when it's ignorance that is being, um, that, that is being addressed, you know. Uh, so, so I find that kind of quite exciting. And what about the role of, of young women or women in your novels? Because in, in, in teen novels especially, and for children, a lot of the girls are, are the sidekicks. You know, they don't right. take a starring role, but Avi certainly does in as an adult in Embassy yeah. Town. The, 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 the main character, Deba, is very specifically chosen as a young woman of Asian heritage, mm -hmm. you know, and that was quite specific for a bunch of reasons to do with the kind of milieu, particularly in Britain. Um, uh, but I think I'm one, one's aware of, of, of these issues and you don't want to kind of fall into the kind of unthinking replication of the exclusions that are so often there in yeah. fiction. So you need to kind of have that stuff in your head. But I think also, if it becomes too kind of performative, it's a bit sort of cringeworthy. So I think for me, I try and kind of get into the voice of each book and often the characters will kind of um, uh, sort of suggest themselves because of the specifics of the voice. So when I wrote Iron Council, I didn't set out thinking I was going to make the main protagonist gay, for example, but it emerged quite naturally from that, from, 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 the, from the story that I, was, um, I, I, that I knew I wanted to tell. And similarly with this, I didn't start off thinking I want this to be written in a first person as a woman. Um, but quite early on, it, it, was, it was clear that that was going to be what, the, what I wanted to do with that story. Um, and I think for the most part, you just kind of want to get on with that and not, not worry about it right. too much. You know? Right, because then it takes too much of the story to sort of express that worry about it rather than having it emerge naturally. Yeah, and also I think a lot of the time readers, uh, you know, all of us, you know, all of us readers are much um, more kind of uh, open-minded and interesting than, than sometimes they get credit. So sometimes, you know, if you have this kind of notion that, yes, I am a man, but I'm writing as a woman, 
blows your mind, right? You know, it's like, well, no, not really. Yeah, right. you know, it's fine. You know, it's not a big deal. I, I, I think that awareness of the exclusions is absolutely crucial. I, I mean, I don't want to suggest that you just, I don't want to suggest like you just write what you want to write because then you kind of inherit an awful lot of stuff. But I do think that not kind of getting your knickers in a twist about it is, is, is mm -hmm. indicated. The books are kind of organic. I mean, they, they grow from maybe the central idea. They do require a kind of a process of reflection as well because if all you do is kind of surrender to the things that bubble up organically the stuff that is swilling around in our head organically comes stained with all kinds of bullshit um, that you know you don't get to choose because you're growing up in a society that's surrounded right. by it so I think you do have a responsibility to kind of check check these things mm -hmm. you know um, you know what what for example, what stereotypes are you replicating? I'm not, you know, no one's saying you necessarily intended to do so. That's not the point. But if all you're doing is saying, I'm just surrendering to the story, then Lord knows what kind of, you know, what kind of pap you're, you know, ventriloquizing that, <laughs> that you've been steeped in for mm -hmm. your whole life because that's what's around you. Do you know the ending of the books before you begin? Yeah. I'm very neurotic. I, the idea of writing without having a plot in mind is terrifying to me um so i'm I, I spend weeks with like flow charts and when i start writing i often have a flow chart on the wall with like character names on the top and timeline down the side and so on and i i uh, i plan quite 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 meticulously stendhal once said um that a novel is a mirror walking down the road and somehow when i think about your books that's what i think about I mean, that comes to mind. Awesome. Isn't that great? That's lovely. I mean, any piece of fiction is going to be reflecting in a kind of fractured way the, the place and time and the concerns and morals and neuroses of, 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 of the society that reflected it. Some will do so self-consciously, some will do so unselfconsciously, um, which is why the, the counter-argument against sort of political fiction that, you know, I'm not interested in politics in my fiction and I you know you always want to say well you may not be interested in politics but it's sure as hell interested in, in you, you you know right. and uh, you know your fiction is going to be doing this mirror th that right. you're talking about so I I'm quite happy to kind of play around with those ideas self-consciously simply because it seems to me you're going to be doing them anyway you might as well think about it because uh -huh. you know everything else being equal thinking about something is better than not thinking about it right are you comfortable saying and having your book shelved with science fiction and fantasy or do you think that that possibly means that certain people many people who would love your books are not going to find them there yes i am perfectly happy being shelved that way and i think it is probably excluding some people um, but the reason i am happy to be shelved is at least partly polemical yet yeah, it's not really science fiction so it's okay to read it is both craven and won't work and disingenuous um, yeah and i would much rather just say you know i i think genres are useful heuristics i don't think that they're like hard and fast rigid determinants they're very fuzzy they're very blurry but i think they are not unuseful ways of thinking about literary traditions mm -hmm. they're sets of protocols that i find fascinating they're engines you know the way a western works the way a Regency romance works, or a crime novel, or a science fiction novel, like they, they have their specificities. Of course, there's always going to be blurry edges, and I, I have no problem acknowledging that. And I think, for me, the fantastic aesthetic is embedded within a certain set of generic protocols in a way that I find very exciting. So it would also feel ungrateful to me, as someone who owes whatever it is I do to that tradition, it would feel really ungrateful to sort of not acknowledge it so I have nothing but love and respect and affection for the the generic tradition I come out of I also make no bones about the fact that I would like to be read as widely as possible and that includes people that that don't like science fiction and if I can persuade them to read my stuff then I'm overjoyed but I don't particularly want I, I mean really and it's very compl it's very complimentary when people say I never normally read SF but I okay. I like your stuff but I don't want to do that at the expense of of, 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 a, of a sense of the the kind of honor of the tradition mm -hmm. you know um, so um, th so there's there's a question of how useful are genres as a way of thinking about things and how and and how embedded how uh, how much fidelity to I do I feel and they're two slightly different questions and I think that they have a reasonable use as long as you don't become fixated on right. them 
and I feel very much a product of this tradition. So I hope that I can persuade people that don't normally come to it to come to it, but I definitely feel like I write in that tradition and I have no problem with that. Even a book like City in the City, which in many ways is much less overtly right. fantastic, I don't think could possibly exist without a certain set of fantastic traditions. And so why would I not acknowledge that? And you need a, a somewhat of a sense of uh, a suspension of disbelief yeah. in, in all of that. Yeah. I mean, where, where I would have um, many more caveats about the use of genre is the kind of um, endless, breathless proliferation and sort of viral memeing of subgenres that are essentially marketing categories, you know, mm -hmm. um, urban fantasy and steampunk and, you know, this punk and that punk and, and urban the other and whatever, you know. Now, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and diss the people in the marketing departments of publishers. They have a job to do. They do what they need to do. These categories have a certain use, but they are not aesthetic categories. They, they shouldn't be used as ways of like really, I don't think, kind of understanding what a book is doing. Um, so a lot of these things I kind of take with a pinch of salt and, and I, you know, if people want to, if people want to call things that, that's fine. I'm not the cops, but it's not something that I particularly want to go down. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any sense of restraint as a writer by those um Th those traditions, you know, there's this horrible phrase that you find in reviews all the time that a certain book transcends yeah, yeah, yeah. its genre. Yeah. I want to like run up and hit that, you know, punch that review and say, yeah. forget that line. I completely agree. I don't think genres are necessarily constraints. Now, I think uh -huh. they can be. Right. I think some people do relate to them as constraints. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, whatever. But I don't think that they need to be at all. I, I think as I say, what, what I think of them as is kind of clusters of protocols that you can decide what you want to what, do Whether with. you want to use them or not. Whether you want to subvert them, whether you want mm -hmm. to try and do something new while remaining completely faithful to them, whether you want to play around with them, what, whatever you want to do. I think, I, I think there's no point pretending they're not there. That's mm -hmm. why I have no problem with genre as a concept. Right. The problem to me comes when the fact of these clusters becomes hierarchically organized, so this one is better than that one. Right. And when they become constraints which readers or writers are, are, are being limited by. But even the idea of a constraint is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the, the whole, you know, the French um, avant-garde movement, the Ulipo writers, whose, right. whose whole project was about setting these lunatic arbitrary constraints on their books and then rising to that challenge. So, you, you know, famously you have like Georges Perec writing right. A Void, which is, has no, no, no E in e, it. Right. And it always seemed to me that, to some extent, genre, if you decide to use those protocols with a certain kind of rigorous fidelity but still try and do something new to them, it's a kind of pulp ulipo. I, I just heard Russell Banks just spoke and I heard him and he said that he finds that he go, when, he, when he reads out loud from a book at, in front of an audience at a you know, book signing or something, that he'll come across like an unfelicitous sentence and oh, he'll yeah, just yeah, cringe. Yeah. Do you find that? Well, yeah, totally. Um, and for me, it's always repetition. I'm always like, I'll be doing the reading and I'll have my special reading voice on and I'll be like, you know, I'll be reading guy and I'll be sitting there going, <laughs> Those two, they're quite close together, aren't they? You really could have put a paragraph in between them. I do, yeah, all the time, all the time. I, I, I know some writers don't cringe to look at their own earlier stuff, and I don't want to suggest that I'm not proud of the books, but there's, yeah, right. they're, they're riddled with stuff that you kind of, yeah. Um, I think that's appropriate. I think that's about, hopefully, that's about improving. Growing and, as a writer. And changing. You know, and maybe in 10 years' time, you'll look back at them and say, actually, no, that really works. It, it does, it's not a kind of linear process, but that evolution, I think, is a good thing. Are there some of your earlier books that you wish that you that you had written now? No, 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 <laughs> uh, no, no, ish. no, ish. Um, I, I, no, because each one is very much embedded in a particular time and a particular place and all of that. Uh, what I do sometimes do is kind of go back to bits of them and, and feel with this kind of immensely affectionate, nostalgic, melancholy, I would not do that this way uh -huh. now, you know. And you know there's that thing like some writers kind of going back to earlier books and you get like, like for example, Stephen King's, you know, The Stand, the 10th or yeah, 20th right. or whatever it is, anniversary edition with, you know, 200,000 extra words. The director's Yeah, cut. exactly. Yeah. I, I generally, nine times out of 10, I am suspicious of a director's cut that is not shorter. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, you know, I do quite like the idea sometimes of doing a kind of remix of 
Perdido or Iron Council um, and writing it now, almost as a kind of experiment, as a kind of literary experiment. And I'm mostly fairly convinced they would be shorter. Um, and but I think they would be different books, and you'd have to relate to them as different books. Um, but I do quite like that idea of like not not doing the kind of extended version, but doing a, you know a radical new cut, like a like a new remix. Uh -huh. You know, twenty years after the fact, here is Iron Council all over again, written as as I am now, and that that does appeal to me. Um, but not in terms of fixing the earlier one, but in terms of just sort of thinking about it anew, I guess. So when you look back at your books, I think you kind of hinted at this, you, you talk about the sense of nostalgia. And so does it bring back that period of your life as a writer? Like what you were doing and what you were yeah. thinking and who you were? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of depends book to book. The books have very different emotional valences mm -hmm. for me. So some of them, some of them, there's whole sections of them I do not remember writing. I just have no idea where this stuff came from. Um, uh, and, and I don't mean that I'm like, you know, I'm a shaman channeling the universe. Right. I, you know, I'm very Automatic aware. writing. No, no, no. I'm very aware of it while I'm writing it. I yeah. just then forget, right. you know. But then there's other, other bits which are vividly specific, vividly. I mean, you know, and I can think of, you know, the, there's a scene in The Scar where, they, where they're miles underwater and they're attacked by things. There's a scene at the end of Iron Council where the train moves into the city. Um, and, and I can remember... Yeah, I absolutely crystalline, you know, what I was listening to, the music that was on. It, it tends to be when I stay up overnight to, to do a, a long extended piece of writing. So sometimes, yeah. Um, and the older I get, the more kind of unbearably poignant that mm -hmm. is and the, the younger that other guy was and the more I resent him for his youth. Two of your books, your two most recent books, Kraken, am I pronouncing that right? Well, I say Kraken, but oh. I, don't, I don't really care what people call it. Okay, you know, I, I'm as very long as relaxed. they read it. Yeah, as long as they buy it. I don't yeah. really, they don't even have to read it. Just buy <laughs> it, you know. So Kraken and Embassy Town came out very close together. Yeah. And did you write, were you writing them simultaneously or simultaneously? <laughs> um, no, it, it's slightly misleading because actually Embassy Town, you know, the way, the way books get published, you can um, have these kind of misapprehensions about the way the books are written. So Embassy Town was written years ago. It was written about, probably about five years ago in an early draft uh. and then for various reasons I kind of put it on hold and, and went away and came back and tinkered with it and so on. This is very much Embassy Town 2.0 um, but Kraken and The City and the City were written kind of at the same time um, and that was uh, a very unusual set of circumstances and I was kind of oscillating between the two because they have extremely different voices which was quite right. liberating and in fact Kraken was the book that the publishers were expecting and when I and I was able to give them City in the City and say you know because it was in a cleaner state so that ended up coming out first wow. and in the meantime I was kind of working on this after those were all done working on the revisions I should say so so the the, the semblance of productivity in the last three years is highly misleading ah. um, so I am as indolent as ever really and um, that's a great note to end on I because I don't believe your indolence at all but disorganized uh, disorganized <laughs> that I would have trouble with too thank you again <laughs> thank you for having me <laughs>